So, Berto, did you get a chance to watch the other, a couple other uh, Black Mirror season four episodes? I'm all done. Oh, you're all done. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I thought we'd just talk about the next two. We, sure. we've, we've already talked about the first two episodes. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's talk about episodes three and four, season Sweet. Season four. What do you say? Oh, yeah. That sounds great. Although I was dying to talk about my favorite of all time. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, so, this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist. And I'm also a professor. My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I scrub windows some days, only rainy days. So I thought we would mention that this is a massive spoiler episode, as we always say, because we're just lazy like that. And also, uh, Black Mirror is one of those things that if it's spoiled, it's ruined. So make sure you watch season four before you listen to this episode, before yeah. you listen to us talk about it. Okay, so uh, episode three called Crocodile. Oh. Do you know why it was called Crocodile? I mean, my, my guess is, you know, crocodiles are notorious for surviving uh, against all odds. You know, they can, they can appear dead f- underwater for ages. They can live in minimal sustenance for a long time. Are you being serious? Can, yeah, I'm serious. Oh. And, um, then, and then they... They also, you know, the other characteristic is they come out of nowhere and just, like, take you down. (laughs) Interesting. Uh, Well, there are two reasons possible. One is season one, episode one of Fargo, the TV show, is called The Crocodile's Dilemma. And season one of Fargo is a very similar situation to this. Mm -hmm. Uh, So is Fargo, the movie, right? The, 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 um, The question is to, like a normal person kind of getting backed into a corner and having potentially to make a choice as to whether or not they want to commit a major crime or not, you know? But that's why it's called the crocodile's dilemma in the first place. Right. So, yeah. well, so the so then I also read that this episode is called Crocodile because crocodiles have the cognitive ability to associate memories with senses such as smell or hearing. Oh. And the same technique is used to access the memories of people in this episode. Never mind then. Which, which honestly, I like your explanation better. Well, I just, yeah, I just kind of, I thought that it was more to do with survival because she was like, I will survive at all costs. But they were clearly going for the tech explanation, which is interesting. Right, okay. right. Less about the story and more about the tech. Yeah. Directed by John Hillcoat, who is a, I think, an Australian fella who uh, directed The Proposition with Guy Pierce. Did you ever see that movie? No. Mid-aughts. It's pretty interesting. I was one of Guy Pierce's like f- when he was kind of popular. Well, becoming popular at the time. He also directed The Road. Did you ever did you watch that? We've talked about it. I haven't. You've highly recommended that I watch it. I mean, I'm not going to highly recommend, but it. I would imagine you would like it. Okay. And then he directed last year Triple Nine, which I did not see, which I think was a cop movie. No, I didn't see that. Either. Uh, but this guy, this director, has has directed many musical videos from really? the '80s until just recently. For, I was going to say, are there still music videos? In- there, there are. Uh, for uh, this is just a you know just a smattering. He directed Elvis Costello Veronica. What? Which is one of my favorite videos. Oh my god, that's crazy. Uh, Crowded House, Susie and the Banshees, Bush, Placebo, Depeche Mode. Oh my god. Uh, he uh, Muse, Mar- Maroon Five, Bob Dylan's more recent work, Johnny Cash's more most recent that's work, which crazy. of course you know he's passed away massive attack and blah 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 uh, episode written by charlie brooker he's written a lot of episodes this this season as he usually does it stars andrea riseborough riseborough she plays mia who's the main character so she looked really familiar what has she been in well she's been on a lot of theater tv and movies the things that i uh, have seen that i don't remember her being in but must have seen her was she's in Never Let Me Go 2010. She was in Oblivion with Tom Cruise. Oh, I did see Oblivion. Right. So I think she must have been... There's only like three people in that movie, so she she must be... Oblivion is the the day after today or something like that, right? The the one where he... Or or which... Oh, no, no, wait. Tom Cruise, they live in that, that thing up in the... Right. That, so it's not... So there was those two Tom Cruise movies that came out right about the same time, remember? One was that one. Oblivion. Both I liked. Uh, well, the, the other one has been renamed Live Diary. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So this was the first one, the, the one where they live up in the clouds. Okay. Yeah. She was also in Birdman, which I don't really remember. That's 
the most recent thing I remember. Okay. Because I knew she looked really familiar recently. Was she, was she one of the women on stage? Was she? One? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Nocturnal Animals, which I saw. She was in Battle of the Sexes, which I have yet to see. And she's in an upcoming movie called Wake. It's a six-part series about Waco. Whoa. Which should be pretty interesting. That should be very epic. Yeah. On what, like Netflix or something? I don't know. Holy crap. I would guess. But anyway, Andrew Gower plays Rob, the boy, boyfriend at the beginning of the episode. He's been on several TV shows. Yeah, I've seen him too. Oh, you have? Yeah, he looked familiar too. Uh, not to me. He's uh, The only thing I recognize that he's been in is Outlander, which I barely watched. Mm. Uh, and the investigator is played by Kieran Sawar, and she has been in a lot of TV shows, I think, in Britain. Okay, and the plot goes as such, and sprinkle in any kind of details that I might be leaving out here. Mia and Rob go to a club together. I think they're in Iceland, not sure. And uh, at least it's filmed in Iceland, I believe. Yeah, it's Iceland. They're driving home, and Rob hits and kills a guy on a bike on, on a desolate road. Yeah. And they had had drugs. Right, and alcohol. Yeah. And... But it's unclear from the way they depict it how much to blame Rob was. He like, didn't seem impaired, but he was concerned that it's like, oh, they'll find blood in my or whatever. They'll stuff find in drugs blood. and alcohol yeah. in in my blood, and they you know. Yeah. So they freak out, and Mia pulls out her phone. She's going to call the police. Right. And Rob says no, stops her, and says, you know, if you call the police, like I'm going to prison, is that what you want? And Rob starts to dump the body in a nearby lake. So this is a moral dilemma. Berto, you're Mia. What do you do? Well, no, we have to call the we have to call the authorities. So, so the why in the road is, if you call the authorities, you avoid what or you know what? What do you what? There, there's two choices. Yeah, you, you right. either do what she did or call. And what are the consequences, pros and cons to either side? Yeah, well, basically, you're trading, you're trading a, an honorable, honest life lived without the the weight of guilt and remorse and and the risk that they'll still get caught anyways and then still ruin their lives right uh versus trying to do what's right not make it worse because by the way at any point they could have still been caught and then it, it would have been worse because they had tried to hide it right yeah but so but you're leaving out like a whole sections of pros and cons on either side here well, sure, but I mean, I'm saying that for me, the most important thing is... I get it, but, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm talk about the moral dilemma here. Okay, sure. It. So on the con side, it's like they have a life. Their life is being dramatically interrupted by this event, and potentially they one or both of them might have to spend time in jail. Right. Um, they It could get even worse if they were charged with worse crimes and things like that. Um, there's also, I mean... I hate to say it, but it's it's a hassle. They're they're in the middle of nowhere. They have to wait for the authorities to show up, and then I mean they're gonna get arrested. They're gonna get questioned. All these answers. They're, it's gonna be super embarrassing socially. Uh, they're gonna but, lose their jobs. All these things on the negative side. Yeah, right? but Mia won't really. No, she might. Like she's she's there in the car. Like, but how could she be to blame? You know, maybe. Well, because he might argue she was distracting him, which she was. You know, I mean, like there, there's a. Th or he could try to kill her and, you know, like maybe that ran through she, Well, Right. She could, well, I don't know if she, I don't know if normal people, like, this is a show, right? I don't know if normal people go from zero to a hundred with the person they know saying, oh God, this person might try to kill me now. Well, right? but I, so, I do. I, I think that's a, absolutely, especially if you're a woman. I think it's a very viable thought that runs through your mind of because he was very he was freaking out, you know, whether or not that's like a cognitive like sentence that runs through your head of just like this guy might sure. kill me. But the but the notion like he's freaking out. If I oppose him, am I in danger? Yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah. Yes. So and the, but but on the positive side, there is well, first of all, she isn't the one who was driving. Right, so she, right. she she is likely way less liable if if it, maybe li not liable at all. Right. She wasn't the one who was driving. But then she uh, would. So if she, but if she calls, he hates her. He goes to prison for ten years. And but, but the family of the deceased yeah. won't hate her. But the authorities him won't hate and her. all his her family, family won't hate her. And well, who? Well, maybe they would hate her because she's like you know implicated you know there's a lot yeah but well, i mean there's yeah. a, i'm just if, saying if your family can't and look if, you're arguing with like a, a possibilities you know well and, but that's what you asked me 
<laughs> well, no. So those are, that's the way. Right? No, what I'm asking you is what are the possible things that would be running through someone's head? Well, that's what, but those are the things. I would say, like, I think that through the head of anyone in that situation, in an instant, there will be all those considerations of if I do this, how could I show my face if I don't call the authorities? Or my, my dad my dad won't be proud of me. But at the same time, sure, it could be like, oh, but his mom, his mom will hate me if I send him to jail. Sure, all those things could be running through her head. Um, but it is not just, like, I don't, I don't even think it's a black or white on any, pe- on any person, right? Because it could be like the mom could hate her or the mom could hate her if she doesn't call, right? Like the, the, and I'm talking about the guy's mom or the guy's parents. Right. Right. So she says no. So Mia's like, so the, the Rob is like, well, we're going to dump the body somewhere. You know, he's really, he's freaking out. And Mia's like, no, she says that she says no. And she, she, right. she protests, but then he, she eventually, he's doing it. He's going to dump the body. And, right. and a, an interesting part of this more dilemma that's similar to like the train dilemma, you know, the train pull, pull the yeah. lever and kill the, kill the, kill the one person is to do nothing and let five people die in that this to, to dump the body. It was just like 30 feet away. Yeah. It, it was so easy to do. It wasn't like you had to put the thing in the car and then right. drive it somewhere. It was, a, it was a very simple dumping job, you know, the right. bike goes and then it's just like desolate road. No one sees you. No one's around. And, problem solved kind of a thing and she participates in it and so so that's that's what she did when you were watching it did you think that was an unrealistic decision that she made uh i didn't think it was unrealistic for two people to decide that because i'm sure that sadly happens all the time hit and runs or potentially even hit and hide (laughs) hide uh happens probably frequently Uh, i did think it was very unrealistic how they handled the body because they were flinging the body left and right and then flung it right off the cliff as if it weighed 20 pounds. Mm. And uh, two guys would struggle swinging a full grown male's body. Dead weight, yeah. Let alone a guy and a very, very skinny woman. Yeah, yeah, true. <clears throat> so uh, that was hilarious. But other than that, um, I thought, I thought, yeah, I mean, that could certainly happen. I could see that happening. So 15 years later, later Mia later. is later, uh, Mia is happily married and she has a son and she has a successful career and, and she's well respected. Like yeah. she seems like the they don't go into too much detail but she's like the top of her field or yeah, something. Yeah, they didn't really go into detail, yeah. yeah. She goes on a business trip and they she's in her hotel room and Rob, so this is 15 yeah. years later, meets up with her. And they meet in her hotel room. They're just going to catch up. It's not a tryst or anything. They, it, they, seemingly, they, they haven't seen each other for many years. And he tells her, uh, I've, I've been through alcohol recovery, right. uh, presumably some sort of AA situation. He's been sober for nine months. And he wants to make amends for all the things that, he's, that he did while he was using drugs in the past including confessing about what happened that night. He right. he came across some news article that had the victim, the person that they killed, his his wife was in the newspaper talking about how she doesn't know what happened to her husband and she's And still, it ruined her life. Yeah, and she's still looking for her yeah. for him and now she's just kind of uh you know, in her house depressed alone waiting. Right. And he decides he's going to write a, an anonymous letter to her and which is interesting it's like why did rob need to go to mia to even say that you know what i mean like maybe just to get her approval or but 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 then mia's like no you can't write that letter to the victim's wife because if they somehow randomly trace that letter back to you then you, you know, you're going to out me and then I'm going to then. I actually thought the way I read it was because you remember she was against the idea to begin with. Mm-hmm. So the way I read it was like the guy after 15 years, finally deciding it was time to take responsibility and thought that he, she would appreciate that he was finally going to take responsibility because oh. she wanted to from the start. Oh, OK, but obviously he wasn't thinking it through very well. But <clears throat> but OK, so. So Mia says no to this. She's like uh, terrified yeah. about what this 
will do to her life. And and if it was traced back to her, she absolutely would be uh, found. Now she's covered it up for 15 years right. and helped dispose of the body. And right. it's like, so then now she's an accessory to manslaughter. And right. These things. So next moral dilemma, what would you do, Berto? But once again, me personally, I, I wouldn't have gone that far. But at this point, I would certainly be like, break down in tears. You're absolutely right. I can't believe we let... Basically, we got 15 years of life on borrowed time, and now it's time to like make up for it by writing a letter to. The... No, like let's go to the authorities. <laughs> like really? Well, I mean, I'm just you're asking me what I would do. How no. do you know that? Uh, you seem f- f- uh, very. I am. I'm very pretty sure of I'm your. I'm pretty black or black and white about me. I know you <laughs> are when it comes to. I mean, have you ever been in a situation like this? Well, it's just, I had three experiences when I was a kid that were very formative about telling the truth. And I, I paid the consequences unnecessarily for not telling the truth. Sure. And so, I, it's just like got but, ingrained but those situations, deep in my brain. Well, sure. And those situations telling, you know, coming forward meant getting grounded for a week or something, not going to prison for 20 years. I Yes, but the pain I, I, I experienced from not telling the truth lasted years. Meaning, I, I, I this sounds like an exaggeration. Do you want to tell I, the story? Sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so the first time, I was in uh, th- third grade. Yes, third grade. And uh, the teacher is a music teacher, and he asked us a question. Um, I raised my hand along with another student, and I said the answer that I thought it was. I don't remember the question, but whatever it was, he said, no, anyone else? Now, I had lived in the States for two years at that point, but now I was back in Colombia. So living here, I had picked up a couple of mannerisms, or several mannerisms that are typical here, but are not very common in Colombia. One of them is kind of clenching your fist and making a face when you do something, when you screw up. So I went... You're tearing me up. Yeah, like that. Exactly. So I I clenched my fist and I went, oh, and if you can't see me, I'm scrunching my face and going like, oh. Well, a girl in the back of the class raised her hand and said, teacher, someone is making faces at you. And then he said, who's making faces? And she's like, one of those boys over there oh my god so he's like okay the two of you to the front of the class and so i went and tried to explain what who was that girl and she became one of my best friends but at the time she was a total why would you tattle no it's just ridiculous so the two of us went to the front of the class and i was trying to explain but he was having none of it it's like two of the principals so this is like a short (laughs) bout in the states and then you went back to columbia i lived in the states for first grade and half of second grade I thought you said this is third. Oh, this is back in Columbia. Now I'm back in Columbia and it's third grade. Yeah. So I go to the principal's office and I'm trying to explain myself. And they had this style of of treating kids like they don't matter. So they didn't want to hear anything. They didn't want to hear an explanation. Nothing. Yeah. So they were just oh, like, I, I, I you're going to sign this letter and you're going to take, or not, not sign, you're going to take this letter home to your dad. He's going to sign it and you're going to bring it back. Yeah, yeah. And I was deathly afraid of this. Yeah. I was like, I can't do this. I can't. So I took the letter home and I knew I couldn't show it to my dad. I don't know why, I, but in my mind, so it was felt this when as you. If, so was this when you ran over someone on a bike and dumped him in a lake? <laughs> no, not quite. Oh. I just, I felt that in the back of my mind, I thought the worst possible thing in the world would be telling my dad this right now. Yeah. So for that reason, I grabbed the letter and I hid it underneath my desk. So my desk at home had a, a sheet of uh, paper on top of it, taped so that you could draw on it. And I lifted the tape and I hid it under that and I taped it back. And then every single day in the morning, I would wake up and look, sure that in the nighttime, my dad had pulled up the thing and found the letter. During school, I was thinking, my dad is going to find the letter. On the way home on the bus, I was thinking, when I get home, it's going to be the end of me. I would arrive in the house and I would be ready for my dad to like grab me and yell, nothing. Day after day. And this lasted for months in agony, like I had killed someone, right? Years later, my dad was cleaning. We were cleaning. He rips off the thing. He's like, what's this? And then I'm like, 
oh, you know, and then so I finally told him the story. And by then I was several years older, so we like laughed about it. But I told him like, oh, I, I agonized about that for months and stuff. So that was the first one. And <clears throat> I didn't learn, like I, it, it didn't click in my head till when I, till the years later when we found the letter, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, I didn't tell him. He could have helped me. We could have gone to the school together. He could have been like, hey, my son tells a very different story, you know, whatever, right? So that was the first one. The second one uh, was I am at school. It's all, you know, school. And I'm outside and there are kids uh, throwing hail because in Colombia it doesn't snow, but there is hail every now and then in, in Bogota. Actually, quite often. And these kids were throwing hail and it was the end of recess. Made of cocaine. Made of cocaine. Now, I was about a half soccer field length, maybe a quarter soccer field length away from those kids. I don't know those kids. They're not my friends. They're throwing hail at each other. A teacher says, you guys to the principal's office. Now, I assume she's not talking to me. So I keep walking. And now it's time to go back to class. She's like, you too. I'm like, oh, I wasn't. You go to the principal's. But I been, go to the. So I got sent to the principal's office. Once again. Can you say that in Spanish? Oh, just kidding. Um, a, la, a la oficina del, de la directora. A la oficina de la directora. And what did you say? I said, no, I said, no, no soy yo. Esos no son mis amigos. Yo ni siquiera está. But I couldn't because she wouldn't even let me get an, a word in edgewise. And I get said, now this is, I was older then. I was like in, I think I was in seventh grade. Maybe sixth, sixth or seventh grade. So much older than third grade, right? I go to the principal's office and once again, I can't even explain myself. I'm like, listen, I don't know. It doesn't matter. So they, they punished me. I had to uh, stay after school for, I think, three days that week or two days that week. Oh, my God. Yeah, like do detention after school. What's wrong with throwing hail at your friends? <laughs> it's just, I mean, let, let alone not even not even having friends to throw hail at. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, even if it was yeah. true. Even if it were true, right. It's like you're throwing yeah. nope. hail. I had to do detention. It's not rocks. It's so, not, it's just like innocent, ha like hail can't even be that damaging. Right. It's got a tiny little right. ice, you know. Well, so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I can't. I can't stay after school because if I stay Were after school... school's just super strict in Columbia or something? Like, I, or was it just kind of arbitrary? They did have... No, they did have strict discipline, but it was sort of arbitrary too. Like so, like just someone got in a I bad I just got mood. unlucky, right? But I mean, the other <laughs> kids, did they just get punished because someone got in a bad mood about something? It might be, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, some kids were bad kids, and they throwing punished. hail. Not that, just like there were kids that bad. There were. I mean, bad when kids. we were kids, we would have actual rock fights where we would get as big yeah. of rocks as you could, and we'd right. try to hit each other that's, in the that's bad okay. in the head, and okay. uh, we never got. I, I'm sure adults were like, "Well, <laughs> I'm as I'm glad they're entertaining themselves right. and not bothering me." Anyway, so, so you go I realize I can't tell my I can't stay after school because if I stay after school. My dad is going to have to come pick me up and he's going to ask me, why do I have to pick you up? Right. And I can't tell him what happened Yeah. because if I tell him what happened, my life will end. Yeah. So you got to a moral crossroads and you Again, decided, decided to kill everyone involved. <laughs> not quite. I decided to not stay at all for detention. Hmm. So I went home. Now, because... And, and so now my insides are killing me, right? Because now you got to go back to school. Because I got to go back to school. I don't know what's going to happen. They know I didn't stay. And I, now are they going to, it's all going to get worse. So it's just like crocodile, right? Yeah. I get to school and they tell me, okay, you didn't show up for detention. So now you got to come two Saturdays in a row oh, for longer detention. Like breakfast club. That's right. And then you met the wrestler. That's and right. The, who were you? I was the geek. <laughs> <laughs> I was the cheerleader. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now I'm thinking... There wasn't a cheerleader. Now, now the fear of death is really setting in because I'm like, if I still don't show up, they might kick me out. Yeah. So I have to show up, yeah. but I can't tell my dad because if I tell my dad, I will die physically. And my soul will be killed. Was your dad really mean or something? No. You were just like... I was scared to death. Of what? My like only theory... Being sent back to no, the No, honestly, the only, th the only thing... And someone... I talked to my therapist about this when I was in therapy. When I was little, my parents split up in a very ugly way, right? Yeah. I'm sure I blamed myself like little kids do implicitly, right? It's like, well, it must have been because of me. So I might have had this 
fear to death of like, if I screw up, will I lose my my other my dad and yeah. will I lose my grandparents? Yeah. I, nothing I would think consciously, right? Yeah. But maybe that was part of it. Totally. So, I didn't tell him what it was, but I said, "Dad, I'm in a play at school." <laughs> oh God! This and is, this is like a. Do you watch Modern Family? You've told me, but no, I haven't. This is like a Modern Family episode. Yeah, it's it's. They uh, would they would spin this into some co- comedic. Yeah. But that would come to roost in the end, and of course, it's a sitcom from the freaking eighties. Yeah. I no, no, a, Modern Family. Oh, and not, I'm saying these are like eighties yeah. sitcom situations. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, all right, you're Jack Tripper, just like <laughs> lying and lying. Bill, this is crocodile, but like funny. So I'm like, all right, Dad, I'm in a play, and I have to rehearse on Saturday. Oh, my God. She's like, oh, that's great. So flash forward to six months from now, you've organized a play and got a (laughs) bunch of people to come, and your dad's there. (laughs) I wish. So he takes me on Saturday to practice for my play. Now, here's the thing. Remember, it was two Saturdays in a row. So you'd (laughs) think I could have said, Dad, we have to rehearse two Saturdays in a row. But no. I didn't know what I could possibly say for the next Saturday. Man, I just have to say, <laughs> you are a devious MFer because when I was that or any age, I wouldn't have been able to lie that, right. that like that just bald face lie. Right. You know, like I, I can imagine being like, I guess I'm trying to imagine. I, I could imagine being like, um, yeah, I have to stay after school. I don't know. It's just kind of something stupid. Like I wouldn't be able to say. A play. I, right. I would. I would have some half-assed lie yeah. that would be easily detected, or right. You know, or or honestly, what I would have done is I just would have. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, I didn't have the issues that you did, but like, I just would have told my parents and said, like, the school is an idiot. Yes. Of course, my parents would believe the school over me. Oh, okay. Would, well, see, in my case, my dad would have believed me, and he uh, would have helped me, and I would have been fine. Yeah. Even if he had somehow unfairly punished me what, it would have been like saturday no morning cartoons this saturday right so so because, which i didn't get anyways because of your right so so then what happened so i can't tell him for some reason my idiot brain doesn't think well i'll just say it's two saturdays i gotta rehearse yeah and then no. and then after that just be like oh they canceled the they play. canceled the play. so instead i'm like don't show up i don't show up the second saturday Oh, so you I just don't you show them one Saturday. Yes. <laughs> so now, Kirk, I am seriously in stress. You're you're like you're you're like a bad Hitchcock movie. Yeah. You've gone down the rabbit Every hole. Every day. Now here's what happens. <laughs> there are these there was this disciplined guy named Ferreira. And think about this that is, name. This by is the when way. I wish our podcast had a more wider audience and like one of the people in the audience was one of those animators. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they would make this into a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Little Birdo. Little Birdo. <clears throat> so the disciplined guy, his name was Ferreira. Can you imagine? Uh. The f- when you, if you think, oh shit, is aquí it, viene Ferreira. Does that mean fire? No, I mean, it's like the, the, the root would be iron, ferros, right? Oh. So he's like made of iron. <laughs> <laughs> aquí viene Ferreira. Ay, we madre. Right? Ferreira. <laughs> okay, so that was the disciplined guy. And every day he would walk by and he would deliver l- letters for parents. So I was sure my time was coming. To give you a letter to To give me home. a letter, because this was it. Like I, I That was his only up. job was to No, I mean he was the discipline guy. So he 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 deal with discipline like, and he taught classes. Oh uh, right. Oh. He taught like maybe literature or something, you know. So we got like a little extra pay to maybe, yeah. To be the, the school. Or he just loved being mean, right? <laughs> and so he'd wander the halls and he looked stern and severe. Did you have a nickname for him? You, who do you need? A, a, his name is Ferreira. <laughs> that was the nickname. All right. So every day I would sit there in class and look through the window and I would see him wander the halls and I'd be like, oh my God, this is it. This is it. This is it. For the rest of the school year, every fucking day in torture, the year ends and the last day of school, two things are happening. The first thing is the older boys, two classes above us are giving wedgies to everyone they can get their hands on. (laughs) So I, because I'm like, if I ever get a wedgie, I'm going to, bad shit's going to happen. So I'm not going to get a fucking wedgie. Meaning you're going to fight back? Yeah, and I might die, but I'm not getting a fucking wedgie. So I avoided them like the plague, right? So I was avoiding them all day long and stuff like that. Roaming wedgie bullies. Right. And the second thing 
is I was sure I was getting that fucking letter. So I was avoiding Ferreira and the wedgie bullies. <laughs> I was running through the entire school, like making sure I'm like, oh, oh shit. Oh, the, okay. That was the most stressful, one of the most stressful days of my life. Yeah, I can relate to that. Okay, so finally, I get no letter. And then summer starts. And I'm sure when the next year starts, I'm sure day one, there, no letter. But think about this. This went on a whole school year and then months of the summer and then I come back and I was still stressed. So there was one third story that happened that was actually the very first story that I had left out. But the very first story is where I finally connected all the dots. The first story, I was younger. I was, I think, in first grade. I was coming home in the school bus and a little boy was selling a Michael Jackson poster. And I had a little bit of money and I said, I'll buy it from you. So I bought the little Michael Jackson poster. When I got home... I couldn't tell my dad that I had bought it because for some reason, if I told him I bought the poster, he would be super mad at me. So first grade, this would have been before Thriller. Mm, it's 1981, 1981. Yeah. Thriller's like... So off the wall, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it was second grade. Well, right around there, right? So he had... we. I knew who Michael Jackson was. Yeah. And... I get the poster and I tell, and my dad's like, oh, where'd you get the poster? And for some goddamn reason, I can't tell him, oh, I just bought it from this little kid at, at the bus. Because, and I don't know why that me what that meant, but I, I had to lie. And I tell him, I won it in a spelling bee contest at school. And he was like, oh, wow, I'm so proud of you. That's amazing. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So a couple hours later. Man, you are a devious liar, my friend. Well, this You're is, a quick and devious this, liar. This is what I was. Because a few hours later, we're after dinner. He comes upstairs. He's like, so what, what word was it? Like, what word was it? And I'm like, what? <laughs> well, like, what word did you get to win? <laughs> uh, to win what? And he's like, vertigo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And then I realize, it's like, did you lie to me about the poster? And I think he suspected, right? So he was trying to... So I was like, yeah. And he's like, why did you lie to me about the poster? How did you get the poster? Did you steal that poster? And I'm like, no, I bought it. I just didn't want to tell you I bought it. And he's like, why not? He's like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know. I just didn't want to tell you that. So... You know, he's like, listen, if you had told me you bought the poster, I would have just thought, okay, well, I wouldn't have bought a poster like that, but okay, you bought a poster. Um, but since you lied to me, I'm, I'm going to have to punish you. you. You won't be able to watch TV this weekend or whatever. You know, I don't know what he said, right? And he told me like, it's better. So that story never, still never hit me right. Like I, I never learned the lesson. I had to go through the two other stupid situations. But finally, after that third one, something clicked in my head. Well, let's take a break, and then you can tell us what, yeah. what clicked in your head. All right, we're back from the break. Before we get to what clicked in Birdo's head, become a patron by going to patreon.com. If you want to hear more Birdo stories, you, want to, you got to put quarters in that, <laughs> in that jukebox. Go to patreon.com. When you become a patron, you get all sorts of stuff. You know what it is. Also, buy my book. It's called Multi-Role Clinical Supervision. You can buy it on Amazon.com. Also, join the Facebook fan group. Also, we have a live event coming up soon on January 27th at 3 o'clock at Antioch University. We have a number of people coming, and people have been asking about like what it is or like you know i i find it funny it's like people are like well what's going to happen there like i i, I find <laughs> that, i find that those questions are kind of funny it's like well what do you think's going to happen like <laughs> it, they, they seem like they're afraid of like oh my god the truth will come out what are you going to do to me you know <laughs> it, and, and so i will say that we're going to have like five ten minute little comedic segments like <laughs> like trivia or uh, Rebecca Bloom's going to draw a picture and everyone's going to try to guess what it is. I might show some old videos or some old pictures of Birdo and me. Uh, Birdo and me will be there. We can take pictures with you after. It's just going to be like an hour, hour and a half of, of just like, you know, a lot. It's not going to be a live podcast because I just don't want to do that. I thought we were going to bring each one on stage and psychologize them. Yeah. 
Yeah, that too. So January 27, 2018. Uh, yeah. So what'd you learn? We like, what was the, well, so all of a sudden it clicked finally after those three y- uh, events separated by years, it clicked. All I have to do to get through life is lie, lie, lie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no. What finally clicked was I, the lie costs me more in the end than the truth. Yeah. And so, and the pain and suffering I went through mentally, all of my self doing all self-imposed was so bad yeah. that I was like, I'm telling the truth. Yeah. And then, and then from there on, like, I remember every time there was something where like my, with my mom or I would get in trouble about something and, and, and like the question was posed, like what happened? I remember the conversation in my head and me doing the math of like, right, no, no, no. Okay. I'm going to have to tell the truth. Okay. Here's what happened. Yeah. That's a wonderful lesson. <laughs> and now you're a too much information person. I'm a TMI person. Yeah. I, I, I was trying to think of when that happened to me and it, I was, I remember distinctly, I was four years old and I was at my friend's house, Mark Hankin. Mm-hmm. And he had, we both had uh, matchbook cars. Uh, matchbook cars? You know, the... Matchbook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matchbox. The, matchbox. Matchbox cars. And Matchbook that, is that, uh, it's like Red Book, you know, the yeah. soft porn. <laughs> and they had, um, all of us had at least a few, you know, like you, you would have, like now I feel like kids have thousands, but but we would have like three or four, you know, and they were coveted and you would have the tracks. And <laughs> right. Gotta, they were awesome. Yeah. I remember the ads were so cool. Yeah. They jump off things. Yeah. And, uh, but for me, it was mainly just something to pretend with, you yeah. know, like Dukes of Hazard, like, right. or cops and robbers. And they had branded ones. So you could have a Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. Box and I had this red one and it had this sort of foiled engine in the back, mm-hmm. you know, where it sticks through the, right. you know. And so I, it was very distinct. And Mark Hankin, my friend, had the exact same car as I did, <laughs> except his was more worn down. He had had it longer or something. And for some stupid reason, I just stole it. I just pocketed <laughs> this 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 match matchbox matchbox right. car, and I brought it home. You know, I just like four years old. It's like I just want it. And I'm gonna pocket it. I'm gonna bring right. it home. And when I got home, I was sitting in my hallway, the, the upstairs bedroom hallway, right. which my parents still live in that house, by the way. So every time I walk through there, I think of that moment. <laughs> and, and I'm just staring at this, at this you know, car. And I'm thinking, what did I do? Right. And, and what, you know, what's going to happen? What, what happens when Mark finds out? What happens when my parents find out? What happens when the world finds right. out? What happens when God finds out? <laughs> you know, and why did I take this stupid thing? I have one just like it. That's that's better. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> like what what's wrong with me that I would do such a stupid, impulsive, horrible thing that now I can't get out of? I can't figure out a way to get out of this. Right. And I'm just staring at this car and it must have looked really weird because my mom walks by and she's like what are you doing you know like are you okay and i'm like i stole a car <laughs> uh, from mark Hagen. Uh, and she's like she's and she's like uh she's like okay well just give it back to him it's a four-year-old so it's like at the four-year-old level it's the end of your world yeah but at the adult level it's like oh jesus what <laughs> yeah give it back to him and, and, and that's just all she said. And then I was like, okay. So I, I gave it back to him and, he, and he's like, okay. okay. Like he was, he was probably like, who cares? Uh, another time, and this was actually probably a little bit before this, oh, maybe around God. the same time, probably around the same time, actually. We were at the grocery store and we were, uh, my mom was paying for the groceries and I was standing next to that impulse buy aisle, you know, as, uh, yeah, right. you know, there's all the gum and the da da da. And there was there was some gum there, and man, I wanted that gum. I was like, <laughs> you know, it's so funny because it was probably like ten cents, and you know, right. y- no one spent ten cents on your child back then. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, shut up, kid. Now, <laughs> now it's just like, oh, it's only fifteen dollars. Okay, yeah, yeah. and so I'm just looking at this thing, and, I, and I'm just like, okay. How do I steal it? I want it. Should I should, <laughs> should I steal it? I don't know. And how, how old were you? Like three or four. Okay. And I'm just staring. I'm just like, 
Should I? How do I do it? How do I pocket it? Why and, did you? I wonder why you, where you had the concept of stealing already. Like you must have seen like a little cartoon or something. Um, or you must have seen kids in the playground or something. I don't know. It's just weird. But anyway, so you're sitting there yeah. thinking. Uh, I imagine for my parents. Um, yeah. So I'm staring at it, and and I'm in my world. You know, right. like like it's a crowded uh, grocery store. There's all these people around, but. I was hyper focused, staring at this one pack of gum and thinking like, "How do I get it? What do I do?" And I'm just paralyzed. And then all of a sudden, this worker at the grocery store descends into my little focus area yeah. and looks me right in the face and says something. But I, all I know, all I think she's saying <laughs> is. I know what you're going to do. Oh my God. And I'm going to throw you in the brink or something. <laughs> and, and that's what she was probably saying. Do you want a gum? You know, do you <laughs> well, no, what she said was, it, it only occurred to me much later was your mom has left the grocery store. Oh shit. You need to follow her out. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Which is another thing about the seventies of like just leaving your kids places, you know, if they, if you didn't catch up to your parents, like they just, you know, well, you know, they'll find me eventually. And so, uh, so, you know, she says some sentence to me and I think I'm caught and I freak out and I start crying. And then she kind of, she's like, what, why is this kid crying so much? She, she kind of shuffles me out the door and then I see my mom and I'm like, ah. <laughs> and my mom's like, why is he crying? And then, and then I, and on the way home, I sort of piece it all together. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, no one knew, you know, that I was going to take that gum except, you know, for me, I didn't yes. do anything wrong. And, and God, you know, what a process. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 you know, flash forward a little bit later, I steal the car and then, <laughs> and, and then that's when I really, and then when you hit the guy with the car, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I stole the, the, the little matchbox car and I was at that point, like, you know, stealing and lying, it, it's not worth it. Right. I, you know, I learned the same lesson. Right. You, did. you, you okay. just learned it a little sooner than I did. <laughs> it's just like, man, that is just not, it's just not worth it. It's no fun. Well, so part of the thing you avoided is you know, I tell these stories and it's like, oh, that's funny. But but it actually haunted me well. In, like, I actually, even a few years ago, I would still have recurring nightmares every now and then. And in my nightmare, a very, very real, real feeling nightmare. Is Michael Jackson like <laughs> coming after you? No, it was, it wasn't ever always, the, it wasn't like always the same nightmare. But the theme was this. In the nightmare, I'd be talking to someone, whatever would be happening. And all of a sudden, I would remember that I had killed and there were bodies buried, hidden somewhere. Oh, wow. And in my nightmare, because it felt real, I was like, fuck, that's right. I actually have never dealt with this, but that's right, I murdered those, those people and they're in the, and, and they would vary what, what it would be like, oh, they're in the, at one time I remember there's like a wine, like the cask of Amontillado or something. It's like, they're buried in the wine cellar or they were buried in the yard or they were buried in the mountains. And there was always this theme and in the dream, this dread that the, the cops were probably closing in on me. They were going to catch me. They was going to, you know, and I would feel it. And it was so, like, so anxiety producing. And I would wake up in sweats. And for the first few minutes after waking up, still thinking, wait a minute. Did I kill someone? Like, am I running away from the authorities? And it was all, like, all from that same feeling as, yeah. a, as a kid. Yeah. Well, you seem like a very honest, I mean, I... You have a lot of problems, but lying <laughs> lying isn't one of them. 99 problems, but lying is... Yeah, exactly. Well, it, it, it worked, but painfully. All right, so getting back to Black Mirror, the moral dilemma, she is in the hotel room. Rob comes, says, I'm going to write a letter, an anonymous letter, right. to uh, the, the victim's wife, which, you know, at that point, it's like, if you could slow Mia down, you could be like, look, Mia, one... The chance that you're going to get caught is pretty slim. It's just a letter, you know, and um, maybe maybe even the wife won't even bother to pursue it. You know, it was a long time ago. Maybe maybe she'll just be happy to know that something happened. Um, if you could slow her down, right? If you could slow her down, and then you could say, and even if they do somehow trace the letter back to Rob, 
you could claim you were afraid. You and, were under duress. Blah, yeah, blah, blah, yeah. Yeah. Like you felt like he was going to hurt you. Yeah. yeah. Between if your options are slaughtering a man in your hotel room versus lying through your teeth about what happened. Come on. Or just say, I wasn't there. Right. And if they have the technique to, to pull it out or whatever, which obviously they did, then I don't know how far back that technique goes. But well, whatever. Lies say I was under duress. Do something. Get a lawyer. Yeah. By the way, I think part of the problem, and maybe I'm just reading too much into it, was you. I sort of got the sense that in those 15 years, she did torture herself about it. And you know she like had her her hair was short and she was like very like organized and stuff. And I got this sense like it was always sort of in the back of her mind torturing her, torturing her. So I thought part of the reason for her react overreacting so much towards him was like, oh you motherfucker, you ruined my life back then, right. and you're back to ruin it again. Well, that's what I thought. So so what she does, and I rewatched the scene earlier today is. She she starts by she's like no you can't you know you can't do this and he's like well I'm gonna and he kind of gets up to leave right. and then she just grabs him right and it's sort of an impulsive so right. at this point she's only been an accessory to dumping a body yeah. and presumably she's never murdered anyone else and so she's freaking out and and at first I think she grabs him because she's like I don't want you to leave because I want to convince you yeah not to do it and she doesn't know what to do and you can see she's really stressed out. And he's trying to like, he's like, what are you doing? He's trying to get away from her. Presumably, if he gets away from her now, he's going to run out of the hotel room right. and maybe even like not even care about turning her in because right. he's like, that, that bitch grabbed right. me, you know? And so they're struggling. They fall down. He hits his head. Then she is on top of him and, and he's like kind of dazed and she strangles him to death. By the way, at this point in the show, I actually thought my theory, because remember they haven't shown us what the techni- what the tech what? is. Yeah. Usually with Black, Black Mirror, by that point in the episodes, we've seen what the tech is that they're dealing with. Yeah. At this point in the episode, we still haven't seen what the hell the technique the tech is that they're talking about. Oh. So I thought she was a cyborg, an android, oh. and the reason I thought that is because I was like, oh, she's super strong. Uh, because she was able then I thought oh now I understand why she was able to swing the body like that she's like super strong and now she knocks him down and strangles him with one hand right oh she's a robot right that would be one of the black mirror kind of conundrums yeah. of of uh, you know letting androids into the world right kinda, yeah. but instead no it's just a plot hole <laughs> so what does this say about her does is this make she at this point is she a psychopath like, uh, yeah, so I started actually wondering, and I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to have to talk about this because especially as I think it gets even more so with the ones coming up, because in my head, I'm going, how many people that are not somewhere on the spectrum of something can sit there and just cold blood murder someone? Right. I That is a rare individual. Plus, given the fact that it was sort of a, it wasn't like he was going to kill her, for instance. I mean, no. th- there are people who, there, there, there's examples even in war. You're yeah. trained as a, as a military person yep. and you've got a gun and you've shot all the dummies and you've trained and you've flown to Europe to fight in World War II and a Nazi is coming at you with his gun and people can't shoot the gun. They That's just, right. they, it's, there's something, a, there's a human thing in us that prevents us from slaughtering yeah. other people and, and other animals that sort of resemble, yeah. you know, hominids. And so that for someone to make that leap seemingly so easily, because it's not like she set out, she's like, well, if he confronts her, I'm going to fucking kill that guy. Right, right. It was a very impulsive decision. So I guess that's what they're trying to th- make it out is uh, Brooker is like, it was impulsive. Yeah. You know, it wasn't thought out. And once it was done, she was kind of, what, in for a penny, in for in a for penny, a whatever. universe of a bank. Yeah. And so she, uh, so I think that's what they were trying to, I think they were trying to make it relatable. When I was watching it, I felt like I was like, oh, okay, I could kind of see someone doing that. Yeah. It wasn't that much out of right. the realm of possibility. But when I started thinking about it later, I was like, that's a rare individual. Yeah. You know? And it gets rarer and rarer. Right. <laughs> rarer, rarer. The rural rarer. So the rarer murderer. Meanwhile, a an insurance investigator is trying to figure out if a pizza company 
is to blame for hitting a musician and breaking his hand. Right. So he had his hand uh, insured, and he gets hit by this this automated pizza truck, and and he needs to get insurance because he can't perform. And so this insurance investigator shows up to 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 see if this massive payout they're going to give this guy is is um, justified. Right. And so she questions the musician, and she this is when the tech comes in, and she uses this device so she can view his memories. They call it the recaller. And it's a seemingly somewhat new device, and there seems to be some regulations around it and stuff. She kind of explains that. And she's just trying to find out how fast the pizza car was going. Right. She, but because he was hit by the pizza car, he didn't see it. So she's trying to figure out, was the pizza car to blame? You know, she, I think she's his insurance investigation person. And if she can demonstrate that the pizza car was going too fast, right. then she can say, well, the pizza people have to pay your bills, not us. Right. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, it's with like a, a car auto thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it, you, you have lawyers that get together, try to pin the blame on somebody. And once again, they're reconstructing pretty photorealistic. Right. Uh, and, not only photorealistic stuff of what was consciously seen, but photorealistic memories of things that were not consciously seen. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. numbers and things, you know, it's like, way. Right. So that's one of the bad things about, and this is similar to other Black Mirror right. episodes, of the notion of perception being a video camera. And, like you know, that, that that's blurry on the side of my vision. You can't recover that. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and memory is a jumble of associations that are built upon other memories. Right. Like when you see a car, you don't see that car. You see a car. A simple car somewhere. That's constructed yeah. in your head. And right. this is proven time and time again when you actually do memory research. Like you have people watch a scene and then later on just yeah. like five minutes later you ask them questions about it the blue coat they blue will coat. they will have it all fucked yeah. up because we're not a we're not a video camera right we and and why would we need to be yes. you know you just need to remember i saw a car you don't need to remember yeah. the license plate or you know what exactly the woman looked like when you're walking right. down the street well and in fact it was you know like the what would have been the evolutionary pressure on one take, perfectly recall a whole sequence of things. Right. Plus, our brain. I want to remind everyone is a is a, a essentially like you know the skin cells that flake off of the tip of your finger <laughs> that, or or your hair right. that that sprouts out of your head. Your brain is made out of the exact same organic material. It's right. cells. So these cells that that send electrical impulses and and neurochemicals around somehow managed to create what we could perceive as memory, but it's not it's not memory like computer memory. Anyway, well, I, I'd even go it's it's sort of even worse than the rest of your body because you know if you actually look at someone's body, um, the the change in their body is so gradual from year to year that that it sort of does retain its memory, right? Your your nipples stay put mostly, you know, your 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 uh It's funny, why'd you go to nipples? <laughs> and why did you have to pinch them when you said that? I mean, you could have just Sorry, should I have crossed arms like this? You could have just said nipple. You didn't have to You didn't have to show me your nipples. Your um the the <laughs> patterns of hair on your body stay put things like that. Why are you doing <laughs> chest hair? Your, Why your not nuts me? stay? <laughs> but but that doesn't happen with your memories, oh. right? Only things that you have gone over over and over and over and over sort of stay put. Right, like your phone <laughs> number and yeah. And honestly, the things you do remember very precisely are things that can be precisely remembered. Said. Yeah, you know, like. Your phone number is uh, a set of of seven numbers that, ha and you have ten choices with each digit. Yeah. Whereas exactly. when it comes to you walking down the street, and and you know they they hear a song and that gets recorded somehow with the exact lyrics. Right. You know, like it, like you hear it once and your brain encodes like every the beat, music. No. <laughs> the, the, the bass line, the right. chord changes, the lyrics, and so now well, again we've talked about this before in terms of like. Uh, and they do this now, which is like y you find a brain signal that might associate with like an actual yeah. thing, and then the computer finds that actual thing and plays it back for yeah. you. You know, or I mean, as as you have 
I'm sure done because you're a musician, uh, you can hear a playback in your head of stuff that you're really familiar with, music you're really familiar with. But again, that is an internal audience listening to that playback, not a hi-fi system blasting it. Right, right. But anyway, so every Black Mirror episode has to have a little bit of a gimme, and and so we'll, you know, otherwise it's like yeah. not such a great, you know, you need, it's about the plot. So we went along with it. Yeah. Um, so she uh, questions this guy, and then she, in the memories of this musician, she sees bystanders. Right. And so she finds those people with, with face recognition, which I thought was interesting, and that technology is already here. Yep. I mean, all I got to do is upload a picture of you on Facebook, and yep. it automatically find, it knows who yes. you are. And so what's disturbing is when they will tag, like, uh, a picture of my grandpa, they'll tag like my brother or something. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, so she finds these other bystanders, she questions them, and this eventually leads her to Mia because right. Mia actually saw it too. After, you know, as soon as she killed Rob, she sort of looked out the window right. and saw this happen, and then she closed the, the curtains, but some someone else saw her briefly yeah. just looking out the window. They didn't see her commit the crime, they just saw her witnessing the the event and so this insurance investigator um goes to mia and uh, and kind of pressures her she's she's you know first mia's like i don't want to answer your questions and the investigator's like well if you refuse i have to notify the police right and now we know from a previous scene that the investigator in order to get a bonus she has to get this in right away right and so who knows what the investigator is saying in this moment that's accurate, right? Well, she had explained to a previous client that, um, oh, you're right about whether or not she has to go report it to the police. That's true. That could be an exaggeration. Uh, because, in fact, it has to be an exaggeration unless laws fundamentally flipped or something. Because you would think that you would need a subpoena Right. To question, if, if you need a subpoena to walk into someone's house, right. you would need a subpoena to go into their head. Right. And so, and essentially that's what she's saying. She's like, yeah, uh, it, it, well, I'd have to call the police. And probably what that really means is I'd have to file a report yeah. uh, a f four weeks from now. The person who, who deals with that report will get to it. They'll look it over to see if it's worth or not going to a right. judge to get a subpoena or whatever. Right. And, and so... But we don't know that. We don't right. know the world they live in. And that's the beauty of Black Mirror, too, is they say just enough to make you think, okay, well, which way is that going? She says that, and um, so we're at a moral dilemma now. You're right. Mia. You're on the other side of the door. You hear this thing. She says, well, it, you know, I might have to call the police. And, and you don't want the police no. sniffing around. But it's it's really dumb in her situation to let that person in. Right. It's like... Again, you pause, you pause life, and you go up to Mia, and you're like, "Look, worst. I know you're worried. <laughs> worst case scenario, the police get called. You've already dumped the body pretty well into that industrial zone thing. Right. And so, and plus, like, they're investigating a guy getting hit by a pizza truck. Right. Um, I mean, maybe she'd be worried, like, well, if the police get involved and and they subpoena my brain." And they see, you know, like maybe right. she, maybe she's worried that. But and so I, what I would say, and again, now I'm just helping the the bad guy. But I would say, hey, listen, um, if if what you're trying to do right now is survive, you either buy yourself time, or right now you hand over evidence, and then you're going to have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And and right now, what she's about to do is hand over evidence instead of, you know, then just go to a different country, like escape, well, do something. Well, at this point, when the investigator's on the other side of the door, she doesn't know she has this brain thing. She just thinks she's going to ask some questions. Oh, okay. So anyway. she's got one more chance after this. Yeah. So so then uh, she lets her in, and she tries to manage her memories. She, like, sits down. She's like, okay, I'm going to really try to keep the memories to the set that of the pizza right. truck. By the way, at this point, though, I st that was her chance to say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this. I'm not letting you invade my mind. Right. And it's like, no, no, no. And listen, I'm telling you, you can go get the cops, whatever. I'm not doing it. I had nothing to do with this. Bye. Yeah. And then when she leaves, leave the fucking country. Right. That's Because right now right. they have nothing against you. Right. Right, exactly. That's that's what I thought, too. I was like, you know, which she could have done at a, at another later point, yeah. too, you know. So yes. so she uh, 
you know, reveal, she lets her into her brain and she sort of detects that the investigator has seen some, some bad right. stuff and she subdues the investigator, ties her up and... Which- which, by the way, they were watch- she was watching porn. So again, this is where the fudge on the technology. You would think in reality, the images would be so fuzzy that she could claim, like, what you're seeing, it, it, I was, okay, I was watching sort of violent porn, so right. like you're seeing whatever. Right, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. But I think they made it seem like the investigator either suspected, like, did I just see something real or not, you yeah. know? And uh, another thing is, like, I have to look at each of these images later to because because she has a computer that yeah. can figure out what you're looking at. But she obviously got scared, right? Yeah. And and I think she wasn't. I think Mia was in real danger at that point because she brings the stuff home. She hooks it up to the computer. She's like, "Oh, this guy has gone missing." Yeah. You know, or this guy's a real guy. He's totally. not. He's not an actor in a right, TV right. show. And this other thing, like seeing a th- you know the body getting flipped. That that's not in any TV show. That you know, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so she uses the uh, recaller to invade the investigator's brain to figure out who else the investigator told. Oh, so because she she stops the investigator from leaving, right. breaks the window, kidnaps her. Yeah, kidnaps her. So now we've her. kidnapped. Right, right. Uh, and Mia sees that the investigator had talked to her husband. So, and at this point, the investigator is, you know, begging for her life. She's yes. like, I won't say anything. It's actually illegal for me to say something. Everything's fine. I swear to God, I'll do nothing. Uh, Mia ends up killing her. Uh, she, Brutally, right? Like with the, she bashes her head in with some, with a rock or something. Right. Again, now at this point, this isn't an impulsive. No. Like I just fell over with no, Rob and no. like, I'm going to choke him out. This is like you know cold-blooded well you know there's a lot of thought here again she could get out of the country and make a phone call and say or somewhat you know call her husband say like that and they show us so this is a question for you so they show us that she's physically affected by doing this but i get the sense that she's more affected and she throws up and stuff that she's more affected by the like the act maybe the gore or something but i don't get the sense that the empathy part is kicking in (laughs) well I, you know, I think they tried to um, portray her, because if they just made it, I'm sure the Black Mirror people were not like, she's a psychopath. No, no. no. I think they were trying to make it like. This could happen to anyone. Right. And I think that they had enough time to give a little bit of empathy, but honestly, like human, humans don't do stuff like this. Um, Again, in terms of what we were talking about earlier, it's really hard for people to harm anything let well, alone well even this. and even the the way of killing her right like there's so many other ways you could have thought of killing her that wouldn't have been so brutal so, right like choking with a rope or whatever yeah or even stabbing might have been less brutal than hitting yeah. someone over the head like with a with a brick yeah. essentially or you i mean or you tie each one of her fingers and each one of her toes to separate ropes you uh, <laughs> yeah. um so then she drives to the investigator's house, kills the husband, and then she happens upon the toddler. And this, when I saw that, I was on the treadmill when I was watching this scene, and I and I I had to stop on the treadmill. Ugh. I was like, I was like, oh no, oh okay. god, because I'm I'm with it on the show. I'm just right. I'm like, oh Mia, what are like, oh come on, like, and then I and then she walks downstairs and she sees the toddler, and because at first it's like, oh, you hear the toddler, yeah, and you're like, oh okay, well just you know just go a different direction, like yeah. no big deal. But then the it's but then it's like, oh, the toddler sees her, they can hook up that right. thing to the toddler, and she's she's done for, and so you see her walking up, to, and I and I was like. Do not show me this scene. I don't. Right, don't right, even show right. me. Just, just pan away. I right. know what she's gonna do. She's in it right. for a pound, right? So just, and they did. They, they panned away. Oh my god! And, and at this point, I'm like, and it's funny because why are we so, you know, all the lives that she killed, including the guy in the bike, are right. all innocent. Why is right. it the toddler? Right. I mean, we, we just have an instinct about and, about and I, innocent children. I yeah, and I, I think it's that. You know, you're like, wow, she was already a monster of monsters. But then we realize, oh, she's got no line. Yeah. She's like a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a break. When we get back, let's continue with this discussion. Mm-hmm. 
All right, back from the break. So continuing with uh, Crocodile, episode three, Black Mirror, Black Mirror, season four, she kills a toddler. Then she she thinks she's she thinks the whole thing's over at this point, and she goes to the performance of her kid, her son, in a play. But she and, is affected. She is visibly yeah tormenting herself. Right. The police are investigating the murders, and they reveal that the toddler was blind. Yeah. And would not have actually been able to right. ID or memory, you know, the 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 Mia, but they use the recaller on the family guinea pig, and presumably they see Mia committing the murder of the toddler. Do and gu- the guinea pigs have really great color vision? <laughs> yeah, and the police descend upon Mia, and we fade to black. <clears throat> so, and um, my sense is, I don't think she knew the police were entering the room. And yet she was in uh, ridiculous amounts of visible stress. And that's when it goes to black. No, she knew the police were coming. I don't think so. No, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what they were trying to tell us. Because you, you see the police, you see one policeman walking through the back entrance. And then you kind of hear some other doors opening and closing. And then you see her kind of look to her right. And she kind of freaks out. She, you see her like go, <gasps> and you know, I think they're saying she just saw a cop. And why would a cop, yeah. why would a SWAT, and, and a SWAT kind of cop, you know, why would a... Okay, that's ha- not the sense I got. I got the sense that she knew she was done for. I got the sense that she knew she was done for. And she, but anyways, in either case, man, the, the look on her face, the stress they portray. Yeah. Yeah, but I think her stress... She was not as stressed as she felt when she saw the cop. So trivia here. I mean, I just watched it again today and watched that ending again. And she's laying on, she looks like she's dying. She's laying her head on her husband. That's and not her how husband I perceive looks down. it. I perceive that as it's over <gasps> and I'm glad no, it's over. No, dude, no, 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 no. Watch it again. She's she's not even paying attention to the to the play of her son and the husband kind of looks over yeah, and yeah. he's like concerned well she's been through and, a lot but she's like it's over it's finally oh uh, and i did not get that sense i got the sense that the stress kept mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting because she knows it's coming and knows it's coming she knows it's coming that's the sense i got but anyway. all right so um some trivia here the script originally it was a man as the main character but the actress was given the script she w- she was going to play some character in in this initially and she actually said hey you know wouldn't it be interesting if this if the main character was yeah. a woman and wouldn't it be interesting if i played that right woman? and brooker was like huh that might be interesting because that does make it a different oh, story yeah, totally if it was a man it would make it less uh less sympathetic i think yep. to the character um when in, in a weird way which would make any sense of course but you know there there's that um it's sad but the idea that some male Wait, goes crazy and kills more people seems normal. Yeah. The song is the same song that Beth sings at karaoke in the White Christmas episode. Oh. The pregnant woman, uh, she sings this song before she knows, uh, she, you know, she knows she's pregnant. Yeah. With, with, um, with the Asian guy's anything, baby. Whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Anyone who knows what love is will understand. And it's also a song that Abby sings in 15 Million Merits episode. Oh. Uh, episode two, season So it's a one. running theme. Yeah. So the first time it showed up was in 15 Million Merits. in which, And she sang that song on that audition, which gave her... <laughs> um, also, I didn't remember that at all. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, the song is Anyone Who Knows What Love Is Will Understand, recorded by Irma Thomas, 1964. Um, also, uh, when she was looking at the porn, Wraith Girls was one of the things that you could flip through. Uh-huh. And that's, Wraith was the guy in 15 Million Merits who <laughs> was, you know, he had his own porn channel. And so ah! <laughs> you know, he would recruit a lot of the women contestants for porn. Um, that's the, funny. The kid uh, on stage at the end is in a production of Bugsy Malone which uh, Jodie Foster was in mm-hmm. in 1967 film, and she directed the she previous directed episode, the previous Archangel. Film. And I saw Bugs Me Alone in 1976 for Christmas Eve. My family, we always go to a movie on Christmas Eve. And when I was five, or just turned six years old, 
we went and saw Bugsy Malone. And Was I, this the Bugsy with the Dick Tracy actor guy? No. This is all kids. So Scott Baio, oh. Jody, Jody Foster, they're all what? like they're all like ten year old kids who are acting like they are gangsters. I never knew about this. And movie. the instead of shooting bullets, they shoot like this white goo at everyone. What the heck? <laughs> and uh yeah, it was a it was a huge movie in eight seven six. You know, 1976 is when The Godfather 1 and 2 was really big. And yeah. So, you know. And it's sort of a weird premise to like... Yeah, it's very weird. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about some good and bad things. Uh, good things that I can think... What What are some good overall things you can say about this episode before, I, we, before we get into yeah. the discussion of everything? I love how it escalates. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, the, just the tension builds and builds and builds. Yeah, and, and that's a hard thing to do in yeah. terms of writing and directing and acting because... It's such an outlandish plot. Yeah. So to make it at least on initial watching feel like okay, I could I can kind of see how someone would go there. Yeah. I wouldn't go there, but I could see how someone would. Right. You know, it all kind of makes sense. I also thought the the setting being in Iceland and the the, the scenery was sort of like bleak. <laughs> you right. Know? Yeah. Very <laughs> that architecture. You know, everything had a specific feel yeah. to it. Yeah. Uh, I love the music and the, 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 I don't know if you call it music, but the soundtrack or the sound effects, like when, when she was freaking out, it, there was this very dissonant crescendo that yeah. would happen. Oh, and her acting was right. amazing. Yeah. Very amazing. Uh, the writing was really great. Um, uh, any other good things you can think of besides that we haven't mentioned? Um, well, I mean, I guess I should say one thing about her acting is that it let me, plus this is the direction, plus the acting, plus the, what she's saying and doing, and it let me somehow hate her more and more and more while still somehow retaining right. a little bit of sympathy till maybe till she killed the 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 husband or definitely the the toddler right i found myself as she was entering the home of the investigator i found myself hoping she would succeed and I quickly said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Do not hope she succeeds. Right, She's right. an evil, right. terrible human right. being about to kill an innocent man. Right. And no, you're hoping <laughs> she gets caught. Isn't that weird how they, our, our brain is so susceptible to, if I set up a victory condition right. with rules, right. your brain wants those rules to be followed towards victory. Well, <laughs> what I would add to that is you've been following this one character longer than you've been following this other right. character. You know, if, if we just had this other character, like someone is taking a bath and you're, you've been watching him right. go to work and do the stuff, and then all of a sudden you hear like someone break into the house right. and they got a hammer, you're going to be like, oh my God, turn around. You right, know? Right, right. But I found myself going like, oh, I hope she kills him. And it's just like, oh God. <laughs> um, so some, some bad things were that I thought that if, if Brooker could have made the moral steps a little less jumpy, you know, yeah, like, more, yeah, like, like kind of tone it down a little bit, maybe, um, and make it a little bit more, a little bit more drawn out, you know, because I was worried at the end, I was like, I bet you a lot of people are going to hate this episode because they're going to, they're going to get to the end. They're going to be like, oh my God, you know, that woman, she's terrible, you know, right. and instead of getting the larger point of this, of not only the tech, but also like how this could potentially happen, you know? And so I was wanting right. I was wanting it to be a little bit less bleak so that sensitive watchers could be like, oh, I kind of can see where that would happen. Yeah, I, I think if sometimes the fact that it has to be about the tech gets in the way of a better story they could have told with Black Mirror. Not, uh, you know, obviously there's episodes we love that are fantastic because they blend the tech part very well with a really good, well-paced story. I think this one comes close, but I do agree with you that like if, if this didn't have to be a Black Mirror episode and there wasn't tech and it was just more about an investigative story, like a Sherlock Holmes story or something like this, right? right. You're right, because you, it would have been very interesting to see, okay, even from the very first thing, maybe they don't have to dump the body. Maybe it's a hit and run. Because, you know, dumping a body, that already compromises your self so much, right? You, you have to, like, there's the dead body. You have to deal with it, lift it, throw it, all these things. Yeah. But what if they had hit someone 
and looked back and freaked out and drove off. And she's like, we should go back. We should go back. No, no, no. Like, uh, I know what you did last summer or something, right? Yeah. Okay. So already, it's the same initial thing, but already we're sort of like, well, I could see how that happened, right? Yeah. And then, like you're saying, the next thing isn't, I'm going to murder the guy. Right. Like, like some freakish thing happens where he ends up almost, you know, he's sort of like falling out of a window. Right. And he's like, you know, help me, help me. And she, and she just doesn't she do anything. Doesn't, right. And then he falls to right. his death. You know, uh, maybe Brooker's like, ah, that's letting it off too easy. Or even, right, right. But, but or even, eh, of course, now we're the writers. Oh, geez. But I was thinking, to go along with your idea, it's that she could have sabotaged him in a different way, you know, like legally. She's a very powerful person now, right? right? But, Rather than choking him to death. Right. But I think what we're asking for is a different episode. Yeah, yeah. You probably couldn't call it Crocodile. I mean, I, I liked it. I, I liked the episode. I really did too. Yeah, I mean, in terms of ranking for season four, um, I had Hang the DJ, USS Callister, and I put Archangel in my top right. kind of category. And, and then, then this And then one. Crocodile. Yeah. And I then, would put crocodile for my third okay and then maybe archangel four what about metalhead how'd you how much did you like metalhead oh man i know we're not doing that one today but that is a sad case of i loved it until the very last scene oh interesting um (laughs) and then you hated it i I wouldn't say i hated it but that last scene took off like 20 points from the thing Interesting. And then uh, Black Museum, where what was, was that your number <laughs> oh one episode? God. Oh, that was interesting. You know, I wonder... I mean, I set you up because I said I hated it. You did. It. And so it was, I was already biased against it. But sometimes that works for the person to be like, well, actually, this wasn't so bad. And that's happened to me with countless movies where yeah, everyone yeah. thought it was terrible. Yeah. Um, it was sloppy, unnecessarily packed. The stories were... Totally out. Okay, we'll get. I'm Anyways, just, okay, yes. we'll get to that. Or that. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad. Because yes. because as I was watching it, I was like, it because it felt like a very fan f- sort. Of, it felt like we're making this for the fans. Sure. And I and as I was watching it, I was just like, I don't even know if I want to watch this anymore. You no, know? I, I got bored, and I kept asking myself, Am I not liking it because of Kirk? Or yeah, <laughs> it, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, uh. So yeah. So I would say this. This as soon as this episode is over. I was just like, oh, I felt like I'd been... I've Actually, I felt like a tiny bit of what I felt <laughs> after watching Irreversible. Oh, I see. You know, I, I actually was going to say, and I thought is what you were going to say, I felt a little bit like the woman in the second story <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> trapped in someone's head. Like, oh, I don't want to watch this. <laughs> yeah. No, I felt, I felt like... I had been through something like I had been made to watch someone do something horrible to other human beings. I see. And I felt like traumatized, you know, Mm, I see. Um, Well, so let's talk about the tech uh, and the implications of the law. What do you think? Bruno? Yeah. What do you think? Oh (laughs) yeah. I thought you said, what do you think? Should we talk about it? I'm like, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, (laughs) All right. So we already said several things about the tech. I, I think the biggest thing for me is, I can definitely imagine a point in the future where they you are able to use on subpoena whatever brain signals for any number of things. Like imagine a more accurate lie detector or a more accurate um, you know something that lets you like empathize with the victim or see sense That's psychopathy That's or, or things like that. Well, I, I think. The first thing you said, I, th- I, you know, who knows what will happen in the future, but I could see that based on my limited understanding of of what is possible with the brain and science now is, you know, maybe 50 years from now, you'll be able to detect if someone is recalling a memory as as opposed to being making something up yeah. and by, by measuring actual brain patterns, yeah. or at least yeah. the likelihood. Like I can imagine, like just rewrite this episode, you hook that thing up to the brain, and instead of seeing images, you ask a question, yeah. and then it tells you the percentage chance of it being a lie. Yeah. Or a, or a fabricated story. Yeah. I also think you can, like you know I was talking about the other day in a different podcast that that um, they do have the technique now where just with the electrodes around the head uh, they can reconstruct imagery that's flashing through the person's head. But 
extremely rudimentary, right. but, well, limited but, set of yeah. But let's let's even advance a little bit. I'm still gonna say. I mean, think about all the things that are inadmissible in court today, or how long it took for DNA evidence. Do you remember the OJ trial? Yeah, they had DNA evidence. None of it mattered. Yeah, and it took decades before like DNA evidence became a thing that was like, okay, I guess we'll allow DNA evidence. So, c- can you imagine the process where how could you actually make a convincing case where it's like, okay, check this out, turn on the little machine. Yeah, you see that rose? You see how he saw a rose? Clearly, he's guilty. Right. No, 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 no. Right. At most, what you might be able to do is sort of like, um, if you if you have enough circumstantial evidence, it might give you enough for a warrant for something. You know that kind of thing. Right. Like, hey, look, we the he consented or we got a subpoena to like check his brain for these things, and that is enough probable cause for us to go check his bank accounts in his house or something. Right. I mean, they would have to convincingly have enough scientists who would get on the stand yeah. and say because that image showed up from that brain yeah. scan it's that 98% means, that means blah 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 blah, yeah. blah and and enough uh, counter science evidence yes. that doesn't refute it or That's something right. um, another thing about the future beyond the law and court and whatnot is surveillance this this episode in terms of tech in my, I interpret it may, being mainly about surveillance. It's mm. similar to... Yeah. Because actually, that's what I thought she was going to do. You could have replaced that with cameras. Right. I thought she was actually trying... Because actually, she does. She, she, she sees a camera. Mm-hmm. At the very beginning, she sees a camera, but it has, it has been uh, vandalized. Right. And she's like, oh, okay, well, now I have to go find... And I thought what was going to happen was she was going to find another camera that was going to actually see... Uh, Mia killing Rob in the in the hotel room. That's what I thought. Well, it's very interesting you bring that up because um, the nice thing slash horrifying thing is you're not going to have to rely on human memory as much, right? Because already people wear cameras, right? right. And it's going to become more and more of a thing. And it's a bigger thing in Britain, from what I understand, in that they don't have the same kind of right. freedom laws that we have in the United States, or this, or the we're not they're not as skittish about. Cameras, and I, right. I think the government has been installing cameras all over the cities, right. all over the place, which, honestly, I'm all for. I'm well, just, and let, let, let's let's take an example of, um, you know, Google Street View? Because I don't steal Matchbox cars you anymore. You don't need to steal. You know Google Street View, right? Yeah. So they drive all over the world with these cars, with these cameras on top of them. Right, right. Don't, do they ever capture, like, crimes happening? Well, of course they must, but the catch is they can't use any of that stuff, right? Because... Why? Well... Look at it this way. The only way for that to matter would be, let me let me take it back. I didn't mean you can't ever use it. What I meant was this. Think of the odds. They're driving by and they capture like someone stealing a purse, right? Okay. So later, the person whose purse was stolen would need to go to the Google Maps stuff, see if there was a street view image for the for the year, the month that her thing happened because they don't tell you the exact day. Then well, what would, would ha- have to well, go- well, what would happen is she sees the Google car coming down the street because it's very distinctive looking. Sure, sure, sure. And then some guy steals her purse. Okay, that's fair. And then if the guy stealing her purse is dumb enough to do it while the car is going by, then- Well, I, I mean, so. think about all the different <laughs> So there have been cases that I've heard of things that happened while the cars were going by. Um, but you know, they have to blur faces legally. They have to do a whole bunch of stuff. But anyways, what I was getting at was- uh, they but couldn't have, the court subpoena Google probably, to get the non? But they also have, they don't necessarily have the ability to hold on to unprocessed or sorry, raw data indefinitely. Okay. You know? But anyways, uh, what I was going for, I'm was, guessing Google tries to get out of that process because they don't want their Google cars to be associated with like police s- surveillance. Probably. And st- you know what I mean. But what I was going for is even ignoring all the thing about I saw the robbery or whatever. Um, with machine learning, they can use the the high resolution images to uh, see things that humans can't see, like numbers that are in a distance, and make those out. So like street numbers, signs, read signs, read signs in different languages. So imagine if you're in a car in Japan or some country you don't speak the language of, and you're driving by and you're a passenger in the car. And I asked you afterwards, hey, what signs did you see? You'll maybe remember one at most. And if you didn't speak the language, you'll know nothing. Right. 
This car drives by and it can tell you every single sign it saw, even partially occluded ones, the ones that were in the distance way beyond 2020 vision, are all you, these things. Are you talking about uh, automated cars? Automated cars, et cetera. Like, so what I'm saying is that- Right, the, that's interesting. Yeah. We, yeah every car <laughs> in the near future is right. going to be automated and it's, and it's going to be outfitted with- probably like 10 cameras yeah to, so you can see all different directions right so to your point of so subpoena it's, it's, it's gonna be constantly <laughs> recording things yeah and then people wearing cameras down the street right. so, so that so that's so there's two things that i think are happening right now which is one there are cameras everywhere and we, right. we see sort of pros and cons to that and two I think pretty soon, and there are people already doing this, who will have body cameras. Yes. Once they're small enough, because they're almost small enough now, you know, with the Snapchat yeah. cameras that people had, it's not going to be too far in the future where you could put a, a the tiniest little camera in your glasses right. and walk around and maybe even have it look all four directions, That's you right. know, and... Storing it, it to the cloud. Uh, yeah, and, and then you just have it on a setting where it's like like the way that people have the setting for their car cameras, their their dash cams, where it's like uh, record, re, you know, uh, remember the last 30 minutes. That's and right. then if anything happens, you click a button and you say save that last 30 yeah. minutes. and they have automatic detectors of things happening. Like they can recognize pet, uh, animals and scene faces, uh, changes in lighting, right. any number of things that can right. happen. So with these these body cams, that is a very realistic future yeah. and interesting in terms of because another thing they're trying to say in this episode, I think, uh, which I felt very much as I toward the end of this episode was like, if they didn't have this tech, she wouldn't have killed any of those people. That's right. Yeah, she she would have killed Rob. And she would have, that would have been it. She would have yeah. been an accessory to a murder that she was barely, you know, culpable for in the beginning. Right. And then she would have killed Rob and that would have been bad. But then it would have stopped. But then it would have stopped because there would have been no way of being able to, you know, delve into her head. She yeah. wouldn't have to kill the investigator, wouldn't have to kill the husband, wouldn't have to kill the kid. Now, granted, playing devil's advocate, you could have imagined that in doing the investigation and finding out, well, who was there, they, they would. Because he actually crossed the street right as the guy got hit. Remember that? Yeah. So you could imagine they'd be like, well, where is this guy? Well, the camera saw him walk into the hotel. Oh, which room did he go? Yeah, like they could have still pieced it together. Right, with cameras. Yeah, and right. cameras and, and, and accounts from people, right? Like, right, right. But yeah. Or you have, I mean, that's the other thing I was thinking, well, there's probably cameras in the hotel room. There's probably cameras, you know, like... Well, the other thing I didn't or the get... Or the hotel hallway yeah. or something, you know? The other thing I didn't get was, did they explain why the car's cameras were not working? They did. What did they say? Uh, they said, the guy was like, well, why don't you just check the camera on the, on the yeah. pizza car? And she's like, well, it actually wasn't working. Oh, geez. How is it driving then? Because how or is no, it... No, no, uh, she said something like, it got that, that was conveniently deleted or something. It, it, it was, I think oh, I think the implication was I like see. the pizza okay. company was trying to okay okay that makes mask. Sense. They were like, oh, I don't know, we lost the tape. The, the other thing I was just thinking about is, um, so you could imagine uh, regulations passing where all devices that are wearable cameras that have on machine machine learning, right? Um, you could say, okay, we're also going to download uh, this small little packet of uh, say FBI most wanted faces. So anytime right. your thing sees one of those faces, right. you don't need to know about it and you'll be completely anonymous, but there will be a signal sent that on that GPS location, that person was seen. Right. And that, they could do that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see that happening uh, pretty quickly here. And honestly, I, I see some downsides to it, but I right. see a lot of upsides right. to it. Right. I, I think that, th you know... Imagine a world where in a world you could have your five-year-old uh, clip on this body camera, right, and walk around. And one, you'd be able to check exactly, just like an archangel. Yeah. You'd, be, you'd be able, to, but she could take it off when she right. turns fifteen. But you could absolutely check where she is at, and look what she's looking at any time. Right. Two, everyone knows. Oh, she's got that hat on. Right. She has that 
So if I walk up and try to hurt they, her, they'll know immediately. Even if I say bad words to her, yeah, the this is going to get recorded, right? And so I better be nice to this kid, right. or at least not mean, right? And, um, I, and unless I'm a complete self-destructive psychopath who's going to die anyways. But they would have done it even if yes. you were sitting there. That's right. So so the you know imagine now who knows what parents would actually do? They're probably more paranoid in the future for, for all I know. But but the ability to 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 walk around and say like my kid and the, and the kid has like some kind of emergency button or something of just like they press a button yeah. 911 sees the last 10 seconds and knows why they click the button and they send a cop car or a drone or something right. you know I, and I, we I, blur everything that causes stress to the child yeah i'm just saying like uh, i think this is pretty exciting tech to me yeah um and i think that this episode is trying to say like this is where we're headed, but maybe not in this way. Right. And I and I think one of the questions they're asking is like, you know, is will this sort of surveillance result in other crimes because people are sort of cover up? They're yeah. backed into a corner because of the surveillance. You know what? Actually, my uh, I'm it's it's nitpicky maybe because I did enjoy the episode, but maybe a different exploration of that concept that you're bringing up is imagine if the episode had started. With a normal family, just in the house, and all, and it's nighttime, and all of a sudden, these thugs break in, and they're like, "What's going on? What's going on?" It's like, "We're very sorry, ma'am. We're here. We got to line up. Listen, we're very sorry to do this. It's just you guys could incriminate us in some crime we committed." And they're like, "What? We don't know anything." It's like, "I know, I know. You just happened to be looking out the window at the wrong time, and, but I didn't see it. I know, but you know, they got the thing with the thing and the and, and, now, like, so, and now you've seen and it. Now you see. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, the the point is, it would have been interesting, or a different exploration of this would be interesting, which is uh, crime. The people that are criminals, the tracks they have to cover already, because they already are, you know, someone who's a career criminal has to cover tracks, right? But now they have to go to extra lengths to cover tracks. Yeah. And that would be interesting. Well, we talked for a shit ton about that episode and I, ne I never thought we would. So I, th <laughs> I say we just wrap it up okay. <laughs> and start another episode and do the Hang to DJ. But before we do that, let's pick some patrons to get some swag. I thought I would just pick the last three, the most recent three patrons on patreon.com. Yeah. So when you go to patreon.com, you enter your name and your address, and then I send you swag. And we have Suzanne, Stephen, and Rachel, uh, or Rochelle. I'm not sure uh, if that's right. So maybe Rochelle. Rochelle, Stephen, and Suzanne, you joined all uh, in early January 2018, and we will send you swag in the mail. Yay. Now, see if someone had been listening just now and would have joined quickly. Would that have counted? Yeah, absolutely. In the future? Yeah. Well, they'd have to be listening like right outside the door. Time machine? Yeah. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself. And if you run into a moral dilemma, just give the hot box. The hot box? The hot box. The give match the box. box. The, just give the car back to Mark Hankin. <laughs> just, just don't, you know, just do it. Tell your daddy what you've done. Because? You deserve it. <laughs>